our second rewilding uh, lunchtime seminar. Uh, and on your behalf, I'm really delighted to welcome Randall Plunkett to uh, make his presentation to us on rewilding the Dunsany Nature Reserve in County Meath. Uh, Randall Plunkett is a film director and founder of the Dunsany Nature Reserve. And uh, some of you may know that Dunsany Estate is la Ireland's largest privately owned nature reserve. Uh, and it's Ireland's first recognized large scale rewilding project. The reserve is almost as big as the Phoenix Park. It covers uh, 1600 acres in extent. And of this, uh, nearly half, about seven, 750 acres is now being rewilded. And Dunsany uh, has be become first Irish member of the Rewilding Europe Network. So just to kick things off, um, uh, uh, Randall in true uh, film director style has sent us a, a, a trailer that we're going to, uh, we're going to show you uh, before uh, Randall goes into the presentation proper. So we're going to roll it there, Anne, if you can, and uh, we'll take it, take it then back to, to Randall. As they approach, she spots the lights in the darkness. They swing open the door. She's coming. Right, I mean, I mean, you know what kind of idiot walks down a country road <laughs> in the Why dark? Still at the bus stop and not on a bus. I, I didn't have any money. Uh, what's your name? Simone. I'm greater. Being with you has been the best time of my life. Listen, do I know you from somewhere? I heard she's a Satanist. You've murdered her family. Some guy came today looking for you. What did you do? She's a very special girl. But then I think you always knew that. So, so good introduction to our, our session. And thanks again to Randall for forwarding the trailer. And uh, now I'll hand you over to Randall just to make his presentation. And then we'll get a chance to uh, ask Randall some questions uh, towards the end of the session. Thanks, Randall. Firstly, I'd like to say hello to everyone and thank you so much for having me at your meeting. Um, Dunsany Estate, let me start with that. So I am the 21st uh, uh, Lord of Dunsany and uh, the family has, was a Norman family. It's, we've been here since, uh, since the Normans. We came about 900 years ago. The castle is about 900 years, a bit under. Um, we are also apparently the oldest family in Ireland still in their original domicile. So that gives us the age of the place. The estate, um, it's, it was a lot bigger, obviously after land acts, wars and a few deaths. It's now a measly 1600 acres, 1700, depending on which map you look at. Um, of the estates, there's about 500 acres of forestry, uh, about 950 acres of thereabouts in, in tillage. And currently, uh, about three or 300 acres in grasslands. Um, as, as we said earlier, 750 at the moment is in rewilding. That's including the forestry. Um, in the family, we've had some celebrities. Some of you might have heard of St. Oliver Plunkett. Uh, he's a great, great uncle of mine. Um, more recently, we had Horace Plunkett who started the co-ops in Ireland and uh, was a pioneer very much in, in defending the people and helping with things like the credit union, um, defending the rights of farmers so they could compete and you know, building many, many thousands of schools here on, uh, in the country at the family's expense. So we have always had a sort of idea of uplift. Uh, we're very proud of the people that we, uh, we're very proud of our people and we've always felt that uh, we were in a position to, to defend the people in more ways than just knives. So 
moving forward, we, more recently, we've had uh, my great grandfather, who was a famous um, uh, horror and fantasy writer, and my father was a painter. And I am a semi unsuccessful filmmaker. And I mostly work in the horror genre. That little clip that was stuttering all over the place is my most recent film that is coming out in July. So just a shameless plug there. So what's Dunsany about? So I took over Dunsany in about 2011 after my father passed away. And I was a city slicker with no idea about how to live country. Um, I had only one pair of Wellington boots and I didn't like going outside. Um, I enjoyed very much getting up at midday. And uh, certainly if I wanted a good time, it would be at the pub or at a rock concert, certainly not in the windy fields of Ireland. So how did it all change? Well, I think there's something to be said that uh, if you stay in a place long enough, you become that place. And uh, interesting enough, Dunsany has a lot of trees, very large ancient trees. It was very much, I think, uh, the family has always been focused on planting trees and planting gardens. So they had, I think they really thrived during the Victorian era. Uh, and there was a lot of mix of trees, mostly broadleaf, uh, but there's a lot of uh, other trees like redwoods and things like that, sequoias, um, and uh, all sorts of things, um, uh, Iranian, uh, sorry, not Iranian, Lebanon, um, cedar of Lebanon, beg your pardon, sorry. Um, and uh, we have lots of trees like that, those signature trees that are hundreds of years old now and they're massive. And uh, we have a lot of ancient forest. We never jumped into this spruce planting fad. And we do have a few small areas that have plant been planted with evergreen, but they've always been allowed to mature and uh, expire. So when I took over the place, it was a farm. Uh, and my grandfather was a very, very big um, cattle farmer. Um, I think at one point the Dunsany estate had 3,000 cattle. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective. Now, I am uh, never was very savvy at the old farming myself. So uh, my father attempted a few goes at it and I tried when I first started and failed miserably. Uh, didn't take. So we were very much sort of sticking to the, the concept of the landlord where we rent land and uh, we try to pay the bills that way. Um, unfortunately, uh, as time went on, uh, I got very sort of disillusioned by, by, by animal agriculture per se. I had turned vegan about seven years ago, just about the same time I came up with a concept to a movie. And what you have to understand is the way I work, there's, a, a, there's an idea called method acting which is in that, that concept is the actor becomes the role, lives and as, as that character. Now, I, I'm not an actor, so I don't do that, but I do something similar, which is method writing. So when I want to write a concept, I, I live that concept, I study, I, I, I do it. One such example was a movie I wrote called Origami, in which the character writes, uh, sorry, he's always folding origami. So I studied uh, origami folding. So I would fold 10 origami a day as, as, a, as a sort of, uh, if you like, a meditation without sounding very hippie. Um, now, as it happens, uh, the movie was a dystopian film and the concept was humanity was removed from the planet by evil monsters that frequent the night. So with that concept, I kind of wanted everything to see what would happen if the land was left. And the land, because if people were removed, there'd be no human interaction with the land and then the land would just grow out of control. So I tried that because we were gonna film it uh, a couple of years ago and we allowed the land to, to just be left. We'd remove the farming and the farming being the cattle farming and uh, the land began to, to change. So first thing that happened was weeds and long grass and a few briars appeared. And uh, then the year came to make the movie, didn't get made. So we said, oh, well, we'll make it next year. So time kept going. The land kept changing. The movie kept not getting done. And at this point in time, I kind of sort of fell in love with the, what I was seeing outside because something I didn't quite expect was the land would change and it, and it changed a lot. 
And at first it was very aggressive, it was lots of weeds, lots of thistles and nettles and ragwort. And I got into fears actually that I was going to get in trouble with the council because we had so much ragwort um, that uh, I figured that there's, uh, the council from the satellites would be start sending me letters. Now, as it happens, thankfully, they never did. Um, but what I started noticing was what was growing in the fields and forests started changing. So it started with just two or three different kinds of weeds, then wildflowers, then different types of grass, various ferns, all these kinds of things started appearing. And, you know, to cut a long story short, the film never got made, but the concept of, at this point, we didn't call it rewilding, but the idea of rewilding sort of came, came to Dunsany, and that's how it started, and that was seven years ago. Now, since then, the, the concept has been popularized quite a bit. Uh, some of the heroes of the movement would be people like um, what you've probably heard of the Nepa State and a, a woman called Isabella Tree who wrote a very famous book um, and various others uh, like Park Fogarty who wrote uh, Whittled Away, a very good book. If you haven't read it, it is the single most important document in Irish literature regarding rewilding and the danger of losing species due to our ever-changing world. And um, so certainly I recommend that one in particular. Um, and it's a very, very difficult book to read because when you read it, you sort of feel that all this sort of stuff, there's so much has gone and lost already. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I sort of felt as I was watching the changes that don't say any happen. I suddenly had an epiphany that, that this was a really good thing and this, rised above the film that I was making and it was something that I really needed to do it was something that I really needed to to go with because I could see animals returning and that was the very interesting thing I started seeing species and it started with the insects and the common birds it just became more of them then it became animals that I hadn't seen before appearing and then plants that I'd never seen appearing and then forests that suddenly get thicker and thicker and more and more saplings started appearing. And then magically over time, things have changed. And, um, and Dunsany has become something of a, I suppose we're the first ones to, to start it officially. Um, and I'm hoping that we will not be the last. And I already have heard from several people like uh, the Leslies are starting something in Castle Leslie. I've heard various other of my followers are doing their uh, own versions of rewilding in, in various parts of the country and at various sizes. And the good thing about rewilding is there's no such thing as too little land. Every little bit, every side, every garden can be rewilded. And it's sort of, I suppose we're living in a new era of, uh, of landscape design because the Victorians brought us huge revolutions in the land. With their, with their concepts. And I suppose rewilding is, is the complete opposite of that, yet keeping very much a similar ideal of, of design because there's, there's not one kind of rewilding. There's different, um, different concepts. Some people want true, true abandonment. Well, I use the word abandonment, but it's, you know, I would call hard line rewilding, which is the concept where you leave everything, you touch nothing, you don't go there. That's right, quite extreme. Some people, you know, will do a bit of management. I would say that Dunsany is sort of in the second tier. We do a small amount of management. We, we shape nature. We don't manipulate it too much. Um, and then there's heavy uh, management, which essentially moves closer to parks and things like that, but adapting certain concepts of rewilding. Um, yes, I was going to say, if you don't mind pushing the pictures as I go, um, and there's some pictures there of a nice deer, that's um, the estate itself um, has, like I said, gone through many changes. So one of the things you will see at Dunsany is the grass became very, very long and became very, very thick. There's a field here. There's, this is exactly, this is an area of forestry. All these ferns and, and different weeds have started growing. And as, as you can see there from that picture, that's like something you'd see in the Amazon. 
And again, one of the things we do, and one of the reasons we've been so successful at what we've done is that we've done taken a very hard line approach with traffic. One of the bigger destroyers of, of, of the wild is human traffic, is, is people walking, pushing prams, rock concerts, whatever. That, that's truly the worst. So at certain times a year, there are areas that I do not go to, and there's other areas that I do not allow people to go to. We have uh, we follow the deer tracks, and the even my employees when they're managing or doing any kind of farm activity, they have to follow these tracks. The idea behind this concept is the less you interfere in areas, the areas are, are able to be to grow and expand, and animals and creatures that perhaps are easily scared can find can find habitat. And not be disturbed and that's one of the ring reasons we've uh, had such increases i think in our bird numbers and and other animals um in fact i can say today i got a video just before this uh this meeting that we've had our uh, a bunch of woodpeckers have now given birth to lots of chicklets i believe that's what you call them and i got sent a video we will be posting it later on social media but we've been very successful we were the first place to document a, um, the return of the spotted woodpecker. And that was uh, officially caught by one of our followers two years ago, two years ago, yes, uh, last year during the lockdown. And um, even though we were sure that they were here before, we had a breeding pair. And uh, we went from two last year, and now we have seven and not including the new ones. So we might be as high as 10 or 12 at this point. And if you consider that this has only been two to three years, that's a big success. And they haven't been uh, officially spotted in, in County Meath, where I am, in 100 years. So that's very, very exciting. Um, among some of the other bird populations we have, we have seen the return of the red kite. Some of them have been birds that have been put out, and some are have returned naturally. Uh, we keep a, a fairly tight schedule, a fairly tight document on, on the birds. Now, one of the things we also have been doing, my, my main goal here has always been science. Um, there is not much study in rewilding. There's a lot of people in the academic community who have concepts. Um, myself, I am not a scientist. Uh, I am just someone who has lived rewilding for seven years. Um, so my two cents, perhaps not quite uh, official, but my experience has been quite large. And um, the thing that we have seen here, uh, and, and the concept that I have always wanted to see is let's let's learn about it. The more we learn, the more we know. And if we can understand nature, we can solve some of nature's problems and in, perhaps even stop some of the dwindling of nature. So uh, we have opened up to Trinity College, two students there are two of our students who, who had theses last year. And they were studying things from uh, tree regeneration and uh, things like grass. And we've also had insect studies. And the populations uh, for beetles, we were doing a lot of studies on beetle numbers. And normally when they would set a beetle trap, they would normally come and check it after a week. Unfortunately, due to the high level of insect life that goes on in Dunsany, they had to check it every 24 hours because the traps were just full. So that gives you a little bit of perspective uh, of what's in the grass. Um, butterflies, you've probably heard that the butterflies are dying out. Our numbers are increasing astronomically. We did a survey of a 200 meter walk along the field and we managed to count more than 50 in that 200 meter stretch. Um, that's very, very good. Uh, considering when I started, I'd be lucky if I saw five. And so you can see there, that's yew trees that are growing in the forest and various kinds of fungus um, that we have in the forest there. Now, um, fungus is increasing massively because one of the things that we, the concepts of the management, and I go back to management here, um, we do remove some fallen trees, some dead wood but we leave about 50% behind. Now, by doing that, it creates, um, apart from habitat, it creates a natural amount of decay into the soil. One of the biggest problems that I have with the world today is we overgraze fields. 
Um, so the grass never has a time to recover. There's never dead grass going back into the ground. So we don't get that rejuvenation of the land the way we do. And one of the signs that I have noticed as a matter of this is because grass never is allowed to die, you start seeing the rise of certain kinds of weeds, one of which is ragwort, which is the enemy of any farmer who has horses or cattle. And it is a direct, what I noticed in our lands, it was a direct consequence of overgrazing. Um, the areas in front of our house, um, when I first started within the first two or three years, they were yellow. It looked like I was growing that, uh, that rapeseed, but it was just ragwort. Within three years, the numbers were de decreasing and we were getting patches, small patches. And we were seeing um, massive, massive declines of, of any one species. That area here is a nice piece of forestry that we have with these crazy, crazy sort of reeds and ferns. And uh, as you can see, that's pretty outrageous. They were seven foot tall. So unfortunately, we didn't have the scientist who took a picture of that. So he was six foot two. And he said to me, he's like, he's never seen that other than in, in the rainforest in Asia. That's an area we have here called the duck pond. The duck pond, um, we suspect, has never not been a forest. And you've probably heard the concept of Ireland was full of these uh, deciduous rainforests. Well, we believe that that is one and that has never had. And we're, in fact, very interested in taking carbon samples so we can sort of measure as a baseline uh, what carbon uh deposits are in the land that's one of the things we're very interested in because my concept here has now become i believe that there is a space here in both gardening and farming uh to allow areas of air of rewilding to enhance the species but also to enhance the quality and health of the land um i i believe in my heart that if there is enough research we will discover that rewilding can perhaps complement farming and will actually boost yields. Things like the bees, um, healthy insects um, that keep the land healthy uh, will ultimately lead, <coughs> excuse me, to better produce. Um, but we have, we have to get that data. And the only way to get it is by doing the studies, which is why we've been uh, working with Trinity College who have been doing long-term studies now. We've started now in the last year and we intend to be doing this for the rest of my life anyway. Um, and given the opportunity, I'd even expand the rewilding because I'm seeing what I'm seeing here every day is a miracle. And I think if my forefathers were ever to see the land as it was, I think they would be very pleased with this concept. And I feel that it gives hope um, and maybe might even prove my friend Park Fogarty's concepts and fears in his book uh, dwindled, uh, dwindled away to be wrong and that all we really needed was uh, a change in attitude towards nature, which I think the lockdown has certainly changed many people's attitudes towards nature. Um, moving on. So we have also recently started working with the animal hospital, the wildlife hospital and in Garner Cross, and we are working with them rehoming animals. This is where I go back to my concept that there is some management and, and wildlife enhancement is one of them. We are a home of many badgers. Um, we have foxes. We, we look after foxes. We have taken in many, many birds. And uh, we are re regularly releasing rabbits and hares and, and, and all kinds of things. There is no life at Dunsany that isn't considered equal. And we have our heavy grazers, which are the deer. Now we have herds of about 80 deer at the moment. I expect much more deer in the times to come. And that is uh, looking that, let me just freeze it on that frame there. This is what Dunsany looks like in the summer, as you can see. Now this is about May time, uh, maybe beginning of June. Now that grass will go up to as uh, height of my waist. So there it's about three quarters of my leg. Um, we did a study in that field. When we started, there was about three types of grass in that field. There are now 23 types of grass in that field. And I did no sowing or planting of any kind. That has merely been transmitted by birds and anything else that's pushing uh, things along. Um, now, firstly, I will apologize again that I'm not very good at Zoom. So I see things popping up. So um, moderator, if you, 
see a question that I need to answer. Could you just tell me what to see? Because it pops up on my screen and I don't see it properly. Okay. Well, oh, well, will I do that at the end? We'll have some Q and A at the end if that's okay with you. Great. Right. So, um, so going back to to my concept. So this grows, this dies naturally. There is no there is no harvesting. This has been seven years worth of growth here. And uh, what happens is the, the, the grass grows in, it starts to grow around April and we get this very high rise grass from about June, July. Normally Ireland being the, the place it is, it normally starts raining in August. So by about August time, mid August, the, the grass starts to fall on itself. And by about mm, October, end of October, November, the grass starts to die and you get these clumps and big thick lumps of, of grass, which are perfect for things like hares, insects, small rodents. Um, and these, these kinds of creatures are perfect for the birds of prey. And we've had a lot of increase of birds of prey. Um, it's basically become like a soup kitchen for these animals. Um, also, with, we allow dead wood to fall in the fields as they may. There has been natural regeneration. We do do a planting ourselves. Now, we planted two and a half thousand trees this year. Um, some of those are uh, mostly native, but there is some semi-native trees, such as the beech that we've planted. We have planted lots of willow. We have planted lots of oak, Scots pine. We do not stay away from any one we, we, tree. We do not plant. What we don't do at Dunsany is we never universal plant one thing. We always mix and we spot plant in our areas. We, we don't try and manipulate, we complement. So around edges, we, roadways are an area that we typically will do planting. Um, what we are trying to create at Dunsany is borders of trees and hedgerows. We also, um, from and it's perhaps very bohemian to many of the people here and anyone who lives in my area might be questioning this, Hedgerows, we breast them to, for the safety of the road. We do not cut them down. The reason we do not like box hedges here is because they are poor for, for, for the birds. They are not great. I personally don't like them. Um, I'm As much as I like French gardens, uh, I sort of feel that the wild has tall ash trees, has tall hawthorn, and we get these very, very long corridors of trees and, and bushes. And it's lovely in the summer. I recommend anyone who lives in the area to drive past Dunsany and you will see what I'm talking about. You are covered by walls and bushes. Um, and we've seen a huge increase of birds. Now, foxes and other animals of, that are typically not liked, uh, you will see them commonly popping out at Dunsany. Uh, we do not allow hunting here. We do not allow any kind of animal cruelty. Um, we would like to be seen as an oasis for wildlife. And that is all wildlife. Um, we have, of course, um, things like trees. We have what we call, I would say, I, I shudder to call them invasive species because they are not truly invasive species, um, such as things like laurel, which I know in many people's circles would be considered invasive. Now we do have a, large areas of laurel and this was very popular, I believe, um, as, as a sort of gardening exercise. People planted them, it looked very nice. It was perfect for those park walks. And areas of forestry have been taken over by laurel for sure. But what we have started seeing is that the wildlife in our, in our land has started changing the shape of the forest as well. The deer keep the forest open and open up sections of it. They graze the fields, um, they spread the seeds of flowers and things like that. And it, it gets uh, spot fertilized by their, by their, by their um, fecal matter. But what we've started seeing in the last year is a serious attack of the deer life on laurel. We have seen areas, whole areas have been destroyed, flattened. I was driving in my driveway the other night and I saw three deer standing on my driveway um, breasting my laurel. And there I said to the, one of the employees, I accused him of trying to, to, to shave the bushes. And he scratched his head and said, it wasn't me, it's been the deer. And there it was, the evidence, the deer was sitting there nibbling on the laurel. 
And there are huge sections which they have destroyed. And I'm talking about seriously destroyed. They've flattened it, they've broken it, they've stripped the bark. And Laurel, anyone who knows about Laurel, it's as hardy as you get. And they've destroyed huge sections of it and opened up the forest. And interesting enough, uh, the common idea that you get um, with deer destroying all saplings. Um, one of the science studies that we've done is we found that that's not to be true here at Dunsany. There is some damage due to deer for sure, but it's very spot damage. They seem to destroy a small area and they leave another area. And things that we have noticed in time is that when an area of forestry, when a tree is allowed to collapse and take out a huge section of forest, typically you will have that land go opens up a huge area of light into the forest and we will see things like hawthorn immediately shoot up. And then in and behind the hawthorn, oaks, ash start to grow. And the deer stay away from those. The briars protect the deer. So all the things that are typically people accuse of, of, of being leaving land to be idle, you know, briars, the enemy of any gardener, those are actually what's protecting the tree growth. So we're a very big advocate of briars. I love all the things that nobody loves, including the foxes. And that's as a result has led to a lot of our deer population to stay away from our, our slower growing trees. So if you like, uh, nature protects its own so it can flourish. And we've adopted some of those planting measures on our own tree planting. We planted two and a half thousand trees this year. None of them had tree guards. What we were doing, and, and bear in mind, uh, the deer have eaten some of them, don't get me wrong, but many have not been touched. And what we typically do is we plant a lot of hawthorn and you know, things around that, around the slower growing trees, and they've stayed away from it. They don't like it. Um, so we're using those kind of mechanisms to, to, to add to our property. And we, keep our paths open and we use a, a vinegar solution instead of pesticides. We are very anti-chemicals here. And I'm not going to say uh, that all chemicals are bad, um, but we've adopted a, a more organic approach to any of our, our path or uh, road maintenance. Um, the people at the good people of, of uh, Monsanto have not received a check from Dunsany in quite a few years and they will not be receiving a check in the post from me anytime soon. Um, however, the people who sell me pure vinegar have been receiving checks and it is a very effective mechanism in gardening that we've seen. Now, what it requires is a little bit of salt, a small vinegar solution with water and you spray it on when you have two or three days of dry weather and all the weeds on your path are gone. Very effective, no pets get cancer and uh, you don't have to wear a mask unless you're trying to avoid COVID. So that's very exciting stuff. Um, we've also now, because Dunsany has gotten a bit of traction, the idea has, we have never been geared around opening to the public. That has never been a, a concept to the rewilding project. Although recently in the last year, pretty much during the lockdown, the concept uh, that I was keeping all of this to myself, because this was a secret for the last five years, was actually a bit of a, I would say, small-minded way to look at it. Because rewilding is a thing that I'm trying to promote. And the only way people can believe in rewilding is by seeing it up close. When we can take somebody around here, and I took a family um, about a week and a half ago uh, around the estate. And in their two hour walk, they saw deer, they saw hares, they saw rabbits, they saw various birds of prey. We even think, and we saw a massive, massive giant bird, which we believe is on the property, but we have not validated it yet. And it has been seen seven or eight times. We believe we have a goshawk in the forest. Now, this is still uh, unproven. I'm not a bird specialist. I'm trying to get our photographer to get a shot of it so we can show it. But it has been seen multiple times now and this family got a look at it. So in two hours, they saw maybe eight or nine different animals and God knows how many wild flowers and plants. And it's sort of become like a safari park, if you like. 
And I suppose the safari park concept is, is becoming more and more of a, there's more taste for that now because we don't have that sort of thing in Ireland anymore. And I suppose the uniform garden landscape concept is like anything that becomes mainstream. It's probably becoming um, less and less fashionable, um, in my view, because what I'm seeing all around, the, I get emails and letters every day from people who are, who are talking about rewilding their garden, planting mixed, mixed meadows and things like that. And those are the kind of buzzwords that you're hearing nowadays, which you know, five years ago, I never heard anyone saying that stuff, apart from the odd hippie who who was probably too much on the wacky backy back then. But nowadays I'm hearing people, normal people, people who, you know, a couple of years ago were spraying Roundup on their garden and now they're letting, letting the birds and the bees have all the wild flowers. So there's been a complete transformation and this hasn't come completely because of the environmental crisis. You're seeing rises of vegetarianism and things like that all around the world. So I think the next generation is far more aware. And it's probably also to do with a lot with the climate change and the, the fear mongering that has gone on in the science community about the loss of habitats and the damage that it's causing. I mean, this May has been absolutely terrible for weather and has put a lot of our wildlife and uh, species behind, uh, especially in, in anyone who's got a garden is probably wondering when their flowers are gonna pop up. So these are the kinds of things that are changing at Dunsany. And, uh, and I'm hoping that I can share this, my experiences with you a little bit here, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So maybe I can waffle on for Ireland. Maybe, maybe we have some questions now, unless anybody else. Yeah. Thank you, Randall. Um, that, was, uh, that was really fascinating. And um, it's great to see, you know, rewilding on the scale that you're able to uh, uh, introduce it uh, at Dunsany. And um, it's particularly interesting to see the effect that's having on the on the plant life there, and the, the how luscious the growth is that you, that you showed us in in the images there. Um, just one question for myself, if, if we could ask. Um, Fire away. The the um the hist it's obviously a, a historic landscape. Uh, uh, there is an historic landscape at Dunsany based around these grand vistas of uh, and and large uh, tree plantations. Uh, is is it difficult to square the whole pr practice of rewilding with sort of maintaining the essence of that historic landscape, or is that has that been um, part of the, the the consideration that you've had to have in terms of the the way you're doing the rewilding? The the thing is, is I, I'm a big believer of you know we plant with what was there. I, I we do the same in the building. See, the castle itself was designed by geniuses because, the, you know, some of the things we see, even in the old drainage systems that we had in estates like this, you're never, I don't care how scientific the community has become and how strategic things like drainage have become, the stuff that we have seen from the historical past, we have giant drains in this place that are massive and they're made out of porcelain. Um, we have, n there's never, I mean, there's, I've been rewilding for seven years. One of the things that I have done is we don't do a lot of clearing of drains or ditches. And, you know, and, and this is a testament to the quality of the land. It doesn't flood too much. Mm. And even though I'm blocking drains and doing all this stuff, it still won't block. Now we have a few wet patches here and there. That's a given, but we're in the lowlands. The drainage is so damn good because the, the people of the past had a real understanding and it's the same with planting. Um, so. The, I would say the, the skeleton was designed by my forefathers and they had a real understanding of space. And it's, it's amazing when you plant a tree uh, in a field and you look at it and it's like, it's a sapling this big. And you're thinking to myself, how, how is that gonna look? And you're, you're guessing how things are gonna look in 200 years time, you're never even gonna see them. But the people who designed the landscape of Dunsany really, really had it. So what we typically do uh, in the big parkland areas, uh, because I, let me let me be very, very clear here. I'm not trying to plant everything into a forest because we have forest. We have we need the diversity. So what I typically do is I find old stumps uh, and I try and plant what was already there. So when something falls, let's say a big oak tree, I try and plant another oak nearby and try and keep the shape of it because those those uh, historical parklands were expertly done. 
And don't get me wrong, we have some we have some skills nowadays, but but the, the old masters got it right. So we try and complement what was already there. So if a Scots pine falls, I try and stick a Scots pine nearby. Yeah. And that's what we do. And the only thing that we 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 do is we pepper smaller areas with 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 thicker planting. But we there's always room for those big parkland trees and bushes. Mm. You know, we're a big fan of the box bush here. We have massive amounts of box bush. And that's a very stylized thing. That was very much about the the old gentry being able to have walks and shoots. Mm. And uh, it's funny because that's become so native here in Dunsany. Like the boxes have spread, box bushes have spread all over the estate. Yeah. And you, you don't suffer from the dreaded Japanese knotweed. At all or we so. have not had a major problem. We had one small area of Japanese knotweed. Now, this might scare a few people, but Japanese knotweed is a is a food. Even you can eat it. Um, now, I didn't go and eat my Japanese knotweed before I say anything, but it is a medicine. And although it is very invasive, we had only one small section, and we did have to treat it, unfortunately, because it was next in the neighborhood, and we didn't want to destroy our neighbor's house. So we did have to do, do, dose that with uh, unfortunate chemicals, but uh, unfortunately it was a small section by the road and I think it was only two meters in and we got yeah. rid of that. But we have not had any issues with, with other than that. Yeah. Um, and we have no problems with the rhododendron, the dreaded rhododendron, which I got to be honest with you, I quite like the look of, but it is a, a hazard. Can, can be amazing. Thanks for that, Randall. I was just conscious of the time and I, Go through yep, some other people's uh, input if, if if that's okay. Uh, Ayuri, I hope I got your your name pronunciation right. Have you, uh, is asking Randall, have you ever been in the Chernobyl site in Ukraine? And I think your movie concept might align well with the history of that place. That's obviously it a massive rewilding area. It absolutely did, and it was a big inspiration when I was writing it because. Uh, I mean, I find Chernobyl to be one of the most beautiful things in the world. Uh, although it was based, it was founded in something absolutely awful. The when you see pictures of it, it's very inspiring. No, absolutely, that's exactly what I wanted. But I wanted to see what it happened, what would happen in Ireland, and that's where you know because the Ukraine. I mean, let's be honest, it's a different landscape entirely, and seeing what what happens in in, in parkland like this um, was very interesting because we do have a lot of old old. Um, old cottages that have long since been swallowed by the forest. And it is very much my own private Chernobyl, yeah. uh, minus the wolves. OK, <laughs> maybe the wolves will follow. And, and just on that, Alistair Fur, Fur is, is, is asking, are you considering introducing any locally extinct species, plant or animal, to substitute large herbivores like at NEP? No, well, here's the thing. Now, this is this is I, I must admit now, the NEP estate um, Isabella Tree, who is a, uh, in her own mind a genius, uh, sorry, in, her own mind, in my mind a genius, but we are not reading from the same page. I don't think. Um, so let me let me let me be exact. So the I'm vegan, so so animal agriculture is not on the plate for me. Um, I can't. Pro I feel myself. I can't profit from animal suffering, so I don't. There was another reason why removing of the animals was very important. Um, now. I don't discount what uh, Isabella Tree has said and what various other scientists have said that the requirements of big herbivores to open up land, to turn up soil, all of those things I can totally believe and agree with. The problem that I see with that concept is that is one concept. Uh, Dunsany, I thought, should try a different concept. And I'd like to see what happens if I don't introduce those herbivores. We do have what I would call medium-sized herbivores. And they have, at this point, uh, led to a lot of biodiversity. And I'm basically seeing how far that will go. Now, I'm being very aware that I might hit a ceiling in terms of how beneficial the land has become due to the rewilding, as if I don't introduce something new. But at this point, we're seeing an increase every year with new things growing, new biodiversity, mixes of things. And at this point, I haven't needed to introduce anything extra, but I am open to it. And probably what would happen if I did have to do it, if we, if the people at um, Trinity start sh seeing a decline or a plateau, we would probably consider a, a variable like that. Maybe we would consider pigs at first yeah. or something, something like cattle. But the, the, the thing is, um, I'm not planning on introducing any wolves at present. 
Um, I'm already a bit of a pariah. Nobody invites me to the pub for football uh, in my local neighborhood. So if I start introducing wolves, then I'm definitely never even going to be allowed at church. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, and or Orlet uh, Merna is asking, are you no longer farming at the estate and how is it maintaining itself financially? Or so are we, there grants for rewilding that you can avail of? So I have been rewilding for seven years. We have a green party in government. Um, we have uh, that Thumberg girl, every time I switch on uh, Instagram, Oh, everybody's talking about the climate crisis. And to date, I have received the massive amount of money of zero euros for rewilding and any of my nature work. Unfortunately, uh, at present, for a non-agricultural person, heathen like me, nothing seems to be available. So this is a real problem. And this is one of the reasons why I'm lobbying the way I'm lobbying. There is a certain want to monetize things. But the, the truth of the matter is my project is what I would like to see as, as the prototype to what could happen for the average person or the average land owner. Because not nobody in their right mind is gonna rewild 750 acres of their own land. You'd have to be a lunatic. I'm a little bit of a lunatic and I'm also a kind of, I like betting. And I'm speculating that rewilding will be a real reality um, and a mechanism for, for the environment. So, but I need to prove it until there's science behind it, then we can lobby the European Union and the local governments to start rewarding, not just farmers, because it's everybody's problem other than farmers, land owners and garden holders and people who have a field. And that should be something that we should be looking at rather than giving money to just the guy who's throwing five sheep up a hill and destroying the land. I'd much rather have him getting a check to have wildflowers or whatever. And maybe that might be something that the evolution of the agricultural industry mm. pushes away from, not that over, over reliance on, on small, because a lot of these smaller farmers, they don't make much money. They do it only for the payments. And, and frankly, a lot of them probably wouldn't even bother if they could get payments from elsewhere. So that's part of what I'm trying to do with my project. Uh, the scale of my project allows me to really make a lot of headway in terms of the science. It'll be interesting to, the way the, the current cap reforms reflect what you're saying there exactly. in terms of... Exactly. Um, um, now, also, I will answer part yeah. of that question, because do we farm? 950 acres is, is, is leased out uh, to only crops. We are growing beans. We're trying to phase out. A lot of our farmers are phasing out chemicals. They're trying to do a more minimalist approach to farming. Um, you know, and they're doing all kinds of things, different concepts that are new to me anyway, as a, as a heathen, uh, such as no plow and things like that, which, again, is progressive farming. Uh, I am commonly accused by a lot of my um, critics of being anti-farming. I am absolutely not anti-farming. I'm pro-farming. What I am keen on is very resource effective farming. I'm trying to do more minimalist, minimalist chemicals minimalist fertilizers, let's try and see if we can do things like rotations and, and have advances in technology to be able to do less input into farming for more, more output. Now, it's a beautiful concept. Again, we're trying. Okay. And uh, Alistair on that is asking, are you, uh, do you expect or want one day to expand the, the rewilding to the, the, the balance of your holding there? Or is it, do you think you've got the Got, the, got it right in terms of the amount that's dedicated for rewilding? If I could afford it, and bear in mind that I pay everything, I've never taken any money or anything like that. If I could afford it, I would rewild the whole estate. But the, the truth of the matter is there's an economic situation. And unfortunately, uh, I've done to the maximum of my capacity. Uh, I have four or five businesses and I work seven days a week to be able to afford it. Um, I know a lot of people, they will see the towers and they think I, I'm pretty much living the life of Riley, but I assure you it's, there's been a lot of sacrifices for this project, but I think the people of Ireland need a future. And I think that this is a concept that will help us in the future. Thanks for that. And just um, Michael Staunton there is asking, do you get any complaints or resistance from neighboring farmers in terms of your maintenance regime, management regime, re, re ragwort or other well, uh, plants in, or weeds? 
Interesting enough, uh, the ragwort is no longer really an issue. I'd say that they have more ragwort nowadays than I do. I have only a couple of small patches here and there. So we don't get a lot of complaints. Um, not, not from that. I get complaints from some people who don't like the, the concept of the vermin in the place. Now, they seem to think that my army of foxes are going to go and eat everything under the sun. Now, the truth of the matter is foxes are territorial. If I release 50 foxes here, you're only still going to get a certain amount of foxes in any one area. So, you know, I, people typically pick on the fox. That's why I keep bringing it up. And they don't like the badger too much either. Um, I have, you know, I've gotten a few, uh, should we say, snide remarks um, from certain, more often I get it from the hunts rather than the uh, the farmers. Most farmers around here would be dairy farmers or or. And to be fair, the, the badgers and the foxes, well, the foxes in particular, don't do too much harm to the cattle. The badgers are on, a, on, another, on another thing. We won't go down that road. But the, uh, the foxes anyway don't seem to bother them. Um, but no, mostly what we get, uh, I get called idiot a lot by some of the old fellas who think I'm a waster of land. And occasionally I get those, uh, the communist type, comments that you know think that everybody should uh, they should take all my land away from me since I'm not going to use it properly but uh, the truth of the matter is is that I think there's room for everybody and you know they there hasn't been a huge massive uh, aggressiveness towards the project and I think one of the things that I've spoken to our farmer who has lands next door he's noticed increase of yields and possibly due to the amount of butterflies and and bees and things like that and that's another thing I should mention we're now working with the Irish Bee Conservation uh, Group, who are institute, who are who are rewilding black bees, the native black bee. Um, I think everybody's scared about the bees dying. Well, here at Dunsany, we we act, so we're working very hard with them. We put five hives up at the estate this year. We intend to keep doubling every year from now on. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Randall. And just Dara is asking about your. Um, your relative Horace Plunkett, uh, whose uh, whose slogan was "Better farming, better business, better living," and do you feel that the rewilding concept is is in line with uh, those those ideals? I think you know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a vegan, so every all the food I I eat comes from from farmers. I think better farming, better price for our farmers. And better living is absolutely right. The only thing is, I think that rewilding and other concepts similar to rewilding is just the next evolution of adding something to the toolbox when it comes to, to you know, phasing out excessive use of chemicals, excessive use of fertilizers. Because it's not that we all got to eat and there is a certain amount of waste and land is very, very, it's, it's very, very heavily dosed with, with all kinds of things and antibiotics and things like that. And that does have a knock-on effect long-term. And we have to stop looking at things short-term. Like our great relatives who planted all these trees that I now look at every, every they're 300 years ago. And it's, it's not short-term views of, 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 of things like this that are, that are going to, to change the world. It's the, long, it's the long view. And I think rewilding, if, if Horace Plunkett was around today, I think he would he would say that rewilding is a major tool to 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 fixing both climate change but also improving the quality of our farming. Thank you, Randall. And just to say, we pride ourselves in this uh, in the institute of keep, keeping our one hour webinars for lunchtime to to exactly that to one hour. So our time is almost up. But um, on behalf of the the members and the, the, of the institute and also. The other uh, people who've registered for the event would really like to thank you for your time today and for your preparation for this. And uh, it does you great credit, the fact that you've uh, devoted so much of the land at Dunsany to rewilding and the, uh, and that the benefits are uh, manifest so so quickly in, 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 in the terms of the time that you've committed to it. So uh, it's it's great for us to get an insight into into your work there. And thank you for, for, for giving us that today. Yes, um, and what I'd like to just say just before I leave, I know there's been a lot of people asking and I'm going to say it near because I'm sure you're gonna get ambushed now in a minute. Um, we will be opening the estate for people to have a look. Um, the, the nature of our work here is, as I said, focused more on science than, mm. than uh, tourism. 
so we will be doing very restricted uh, groups visits, guided tours, where we will walk tracks and things like that. And I can show people um, some of the, the wonderful things that are happening here up close and personal. And we will be posting about that on our social media probably in the next few days about the first registration groups that can take part and come and see what, re what, yeah, what rewilding is. And maybe even uh, maybe even do a bit of them a bit of rewilding themselves after they get inspired. Well, I think on behalf of the institute, we'd love to take you up on on that. Uh, Absolutely, I'd love to have, a, you. have an organised visit for the institute, so we might speak offline about that. Absolutely. But, uh, th thanks and, again. And for, one of the things that. I think, um, just going back to before you, before we leave here, we're just thirty seconds. Landscaping is, is an interesting thing because you are, you are taking the land and you are controlling it and manipulating it for the, for the aesthetic. And the funny thing that I've noticed with, with Dunsany and the rewilding, we haven't really changed what we're doing because we're still manipulating the landscape. Mm -hmm. Yes, we allow there to be a certain amount of chaotic amounts of things there. And what we've stayed away from is, is in a uniformity. But I assure you, anyone who's watching this now, Rewilding is maybe an, a different type of gardening in a way. You know, we have our, our tracks, our paths, and the wild comes back, but it's not the wild of our great ancestors. That's something that, I mean, it's not that I'm trying to turn everything into a rainforest because that's, that's an illusion. We are evolving the, the, the world we live in and we are evolving the decisions we're making today will have a knock-on effect in 200 years time. And maybe in 200 years, somebody will be, Talk, there'll be a talking head somewhere and they'll be talking about all the trees and the concepts of all the, the bush and the, and the floodplains yeah. of our time. But we'll never know because we'll all be dead. But this is really, I suppose, if I, I take a lot of inspiration from the Victorian era, I found that they had a really interesting concept. Yeah. And I hope that rewilding will just be the Victorian era of 2021. Exactly. Yeah, and I think the the the, the work of uh, William Robinson uh, and, and the writings of William Robinson, the famous Irishman, is very relevant in that regard in terms of Victorian thinking. So, just again, thank you on behalf of the. Thank Institute. you for having me. Sorry, I waffled on so Not much. Not at, at the all. Beginning. And uh, just to say that these events don't happen of their own accord, and I'd just like to uh, say particular thanks to Anne Doherty as always uh, for helping to, ma uh, to to arrange this and for working the images here today and then Alistair Ferrer and Owen O'Brien uh, as well for their uh, for, for helping uh, and Mark Nugent indeed from the Institute uh, who've helped organize our rewilding sessions this month and um, just to say our AGM is coming up on the 25th of June and I hope uh, your, our members will put that in their diary at five o'clock on the 25th but Randall on, on all our behalfs thank you again and uh, Hope we see you in Dunsany fairly soon. Absolutely. Come and visit. Okay. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thanks for attending today.